Uh, my name is Chuck Traxler. I'm the Deputy Regional Director for the Great Lakes Region of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And thanks for joining us today for a discussion about Native American treaty hunting and fishing rights um, as part of our celebration for November as Native American Heritage Month. Here in the Great Lakes Region, we've got 36 federally recognized tribes, um, primarily Anishinaabe, which are also known as uh, Ojibwe or Chippewa, as well as the Sioux Nation, which are sometimes referred to as Lakota or Dakota. Um, most of them, but not all, have some formally designated reservation lands. They're all considered sovereign nations, which is really key in how it impacts the work with federal agencies such as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's very different when they work with state governments, but as a federal agency, we have some, some very specific um, requirements for government to government um, consultations, which you'll hear about more today. Um, there's also four ceded territory treaties here in the Great Lakes, 1836, 1837, 1842, and 1854. Uh, those numbers are, of course, the year the treaty was signed. Um, and those treaties provide uh, hunting and fishing rights off reservation uh, to many tribal members. And of course, we're gonna hear quite a bit more about that today as well. Um, but before we jump into those details, it's um, a privilege and my honor to introduce uh, Director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Aurelia Skipwith. Aurelia, you're on mute. You know, that always seems to happen. So it is I an honor to be fault. here. <laughs> it is an honor to be here with everyone today. So thank you for taking time to commemorate Native American Heritage Month, a time when we purposefully celebrate the rich and diverse cultures and tradition of indigenous American Indian tribes and Alaska Native people. I'm proud that President Trump is making sure the government fulfills its commitment to Native Americans. Last month, the Trump administration announced 40 new grant awards, totaling 24 million, which will expand education options for American Indian and Alaskan Native students. In May of this year, Interior's Interior Bison Working Group launched a shared stewardship strategy to strengthen mechanisms for delivery of live bison to Native American tribes. The president signed into law the CARES Act, allocating billions in funding to tribal governments, including over 200 million to Bureau of Indian Affairs funded schools. And in November of 2019, the president signed Executive Order 13898, creating a missing and murdered Native American women and men task force. According to the FBI, there are more than 1,400 unresolved American Indian and Alaska Native missing persons cases in the U.S. The first of the seven regional offices dedicated to solving cold cases was open in July in Minnesota. Today, there are 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States. Working with tribal nations on government to government basis is one of our highest priorities here at the Fish and Wildlife Service. Through a variety of programs, the department is committed to tribal posture and helping address challenges in the areas of economic development, education, and law enforcement. I am proud that we honor our tribal trust responsibilities under the services Native American policy and through programs where we work hand in hand with tribes to conserve natural resources on sovereign lands for future generations. In Alaska, for example, the Federal Subsistence Management Program is a multi-agency effort to provide opportunity for subsistence hunting, fishing, and gathering on federal public lands and waters. Alaska's indigenous peoples, as we 
and other rural residents have relied upon traditional harvest of wild food for thousands of years and have passed this knowledge and way of life and its culture and values down through the generations. This afternoon, we'll hear from the 1854 Treaty Authority about intertribal protection of hunting, fishing, and subsistence rights for two bands of the Lake Superior, Chippewa in the Midwest. Thank you to the Great Lakes Region, the National Conservation Training Center, and the Office of Diversity and Inclusive Workforce Management for hosting today's program. And please join me in honoring the cultural and historic legacy and continuing vibrancy of our nation's original inhabitants. And back over to Chuck. Thank you, Director Skipwith, appreciate that. Um, as uh, the director mentioned, we're gonna uh, hear from a couple of folks. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Scott Aiken, who is our National Native American Coordinator. Scott? Thanks, Chuck. And thank you, Director Skipwith, for being with us today. I'm grateful to be with you all today as not only a federal service employee of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but as a Native American enrolled with the Prairie Band Potawatomi of Northeast Kansas, who originally were from the Great Lakes area, uh, stemming from the Chicago and broader area of the Great Lakes. Uh, so I say uh, bonjour and welcome you to this discussion today. Uh, my, uh, my history of my experience of the work that I do here at Fish and Wildlife Service stems from teachings that come from my family, come from generations, as the director described, of commitment to conservation of wildlife. Uh, not for the purposes of, per se, resource extraction, but for the purposes of the encompassing aspect of the, the benefit of wildlife to our uh, spiritual being as well. And so for Native communities, uh, it's, it's intrinsically incorporated into everything that we do, that uh, uh, the work we do in conservation, the work we do in natural resource management, uh, is rooted in our faith and, and stories of our created uh, experience as Native peoples. You know, when many people think of wildlife management, they often uh, think of agencies like ours or like state fishing game agencies or maybe um, the National Park Service or U.S. Forest Service. But, you know, uh, oftentimes tribal communities are overlooked for their tremendous uh, conservation management efforts that they do uh, not only on behalf of the peoples of their specific communities, but also the benefit to the state and to our nation uh, at large. Uh, currently, as the director described, there's 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States, uh, and um, half of which have significant land bases that require uh, professional fish and wildlife management. And together with Alaska Native Corporations, uh, those lands aggregated together exceed 105 million acres, an area nearly 10% larger than the entire National Wildlife Refuge system. To grasp and appreciate the scope and diversity of fish and wildlife conservation activities on tribal lands, it's helpful to look at the historical background of which these programs emerged. And my role in the capacity I serve as the National Native American Programs Coordinator is to work to help us in remembering that uh, dedication that we have committed to uh, as a nation in supporting and up upholding our promises to our tribal uh, uh, partners, to our, our tribal communities that are within the United States here. So, you know, throughout much of the 20th century, uh, conservation activities on most tribal lands were, were really limited or even absent. Uh, and that was due to uh, systematic poverty, underemployment, and other pressing social needs that weighed, outweighed the ability of the tribal government to establish tribal conservation departments. And yet, as I said, fish and wildlife has been a vital, uh, important, of vital importance to Native American and Alaska Native peoples, not just for food and sustenance, but also because of a deep and intrinsic connection of wildlife to tribal religious beliefs and cultural values, as I stated a moment ago. You know, many tribal governments began in earnest 
to establish conservation initiatives uh, after World War II, but funding was tight. And, you know, the, the federal government stepped up to help out states who were also in a funding crisis during that time. And what was established was the Federal Aid and Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Act. But these programs that were established by Congress uh, were not at that time open to tribal governments to participate in. So tribal governments uh, worked to uh, engage the states in addressing conservation needs that are upheld by treaty right and, and upheld by uh, the communities and not, not only the federal government, but within many of the states. But they had to do this effort to reach into the state's uh, conservation uh, support in order to address the tribal needs that, uh, that tribes were facing with conservation management. A few tribes who made this overture uh, also reached out to uh, the, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Sport, Fish, and Wildlife. It's our historic name of our agency that, that later became known as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we were responding to tribes, particularly in the West, for technical assistance in matters ranging from fish husbandry and stocking to big game range restoration. During that period from the 1950s to the 1980s, the Bureau of Sport Fishing and Wildlife made some significant overtures to tribal governments, particularly in the area of expanding recreational fisheries on tribal lands. The service issued, in fact, a policy on fish and wildlife assistance to tribes in May of 1980. This policy was among one of the first formal articulations by the Fish and Wildlife Service to really define its roles and responsibilities uh, toward tribes and cooperation with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So throughout the 1970s, and the 1980s, uh, as tribal governments advocated for improving overall environmental quality on their lands, there came about a consortium of tribes who really began to form the foundation of what we now have as a, a modern day tribal conservation program on many of our uh, tribal lands that exist. Uh, and what they, what they did back in the 70s is brought together uh, a, a cohort of tribes uh, that established the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. And also in the 70s, uh, groups like the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, uh, the Northwest Indian Fish Commission, and the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission uh, were able to work with Congress and receive funds to stand those commissions which still exist today uh, that many uh, who might be listening to this have worked with in various aspects. One of the very first goals of the society was to really focus on endeavors to establish workshops for professional fish and wildlife law enforcement. And that has grown from that initial need to the broader conservation effort we now uh, experience, many of us in the work that we do. Similarly, as a result of Alaska's focus on protecting the indigenous customary and traditional way of living, uh, Congress passed several pieces of significant legislation. In the 1990s to 2000, uh, there were legislation components that brought about the Federal Subsistence Management Program, the Alaska Migratory Bird Co-Management Council, and numerous agreements to co-manage marine mammals with Alaska Native organizations. I give this as a foundation just to show the richness of how our agency has interacted over the many decades of our own existence to uh, help and, and partner with tribes and form a much stronger lasting uh, relationship and commitment to conservation efforts. To emphasize this, uh, back in 1994, under the direction of Molly Beatty, the service drafted and issued its current National Native American Policy, which the director just alluded to. This policy set up guidance of how the agency would develop its future conservation work with tribes. And among the policy tenants, there, there were 10 guiding principles to that. Uh, addressing sovereignty meaningfully, uh, talking more openly about what, fish and wildlife long-term conservation efforts, government-to-government -government relations, self-determination, allowing a tribe to determine for its people how conservation would be managed on their reservation lands, uh, communication to build that, that arm of our responsibility up 
with tribes. Uh, funding to help tribes out in their endeavor to stand up fish and wildlife conservation programs. Uh, culture and religion that we would recognize how our service actions may impact those uh, important aspects. Law enforcement, as I mentioned earlier, is another component. And to offer technical assistance. And finally, training and education. All of that realized back in 1994 has been carried forward to today. And as a consequence of that policy, uh, my program and, the, and the, the program that I support within each of the regions uh, was established with regard to how we uh, interact with our uh, tribal um, communities. My position uh, was established back in uh, 1994 as the Native American Liaison Officer, uh, but has since uh, been moved up into the Director's Office where I uh, took that role back six years ago and now am working to address this from the headquarters office level. Uh, my role is providing counsel to the director, uh, serving as point of contact for conservation issues, serving as the liaison to tribal governments. And on a regular basis, a bi-weekly basis, I meet with each of the liaisons in each of your regions to talk about issues that are relevant to the work that you're doing and how we can improve communications and and cooperation with tribes and seek assistance where needed for funding uh, important conservation activities. So, you know, in the past few decades, we've seen a huge growth in service tribal partnerships. And I think uh, as, as mentioned here just a moment ago, some of that comes from the traditional ecological knowledge that tribes bring to the table, which is a significant component to our understanding how uh, wildlife and, and the environment interact in ways that we in our science mind may not easily see, but can be articulated through much of what the richness of the tribal community experience uh, in their cultural experience uh, can bear on um, support of animal species. We've had uh, coastal res restoration of brook trout along the shores of Lake Superior, uh, an enhancement of Apache trout habitat in Arizona, working with black-footed ferret in Montana, or the Penobscot Indian Nation of Maine as we work to restore nearly 100 uh, islands, habitat on 100 islands in the Penobscot River. And, and in Alaska, we did, through this traditional ecological knowledge um, endeavor, we were able to bring about the restoration and recovery of the white-fronted goose uh, population. So, you know, there's so many things that have been uh, a positive of how we have grown to recognize one another's needs, our needs in the federal government, tribal needs in the tribal communities. And we rest in that tension through our policy, trying to find the most effective ways to continue to move forward together in conservation in a world that we can very well um, uh, attest to is constantly changing and needs more cooperation, more communication amongst sovereigns like we do through our program. So I hope that you all appreciate the, uh, the great opportunities that exist uh, in your own region where you can do some tremendous work for conservation benefits uh, in cooperation, not only with the states, but also with our tribal partners. And I think that's the, uh, the great uh, gift we have today is to talk a little bit more in depth through Sonny's presentation about how those partnerships can really affect uh, tremendous uh, change in our environment. So I say miigwech, thank you for your participation today and thank you for uh, caring about uh, our native communities in the work of fish and wildlife resource management. Thanks, Scott. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Scott for, for quite a while and have learned much from him. And I can attest to the fact that since the establishment of his program, certainly here in this region, we, we've been much more proactive and hopefully much more effective in working with tribes and, and you know, not, not thinking of it as something as an afterthought. It's the initial thought. We, we always think of tribes whenever we start doing work. And, and engage them much more proactively, I know, than we have in the past. So that's a great benefit of having Scott's program around, and he's a great resource for the Fish and Wildlife Service. 
Um, I'd like to remind folks that uh, at the end of our next presentation, we'll have an opportunity for a question and answer session with, with all of us on, on this call today. Um, unfortunately, we can't interact face to face. Um, so you need to put any questions you might have in the chat feature uh, and then I'll, I'll read them and we'll answer them. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce the Executive Director of 1854 Authority, a great partner for us here in, uh, in, the, in the Great Lakes region, Sonny Myers. Well, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the Fish and Wildlife Service for uh, allowing me to come here and, and share uh, what I do and what I've been doing for a while up here in Northeastern Minnesota. And uh, just briefly, my name is Sonny Myers. I'm the Director of the 1854 Treaty Authority, and you're going to hear all about that in the, ne in the next uh, uh, session, uh, time time slot we have. Um, I am an enrolled member of the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, but I've lived in Duluth, Minnesota my entire life, and so that's right on the tip of Lake Superior. And uh, this is, uh, I, I, it gets a little cold here in the winter, but I still like to call this my home. So, so I think I really want to jump right into the presentation. So um, hopefully this, hopefully I can make it interesting too, because I realize I got the afternoon slot and, you know, you're kind of tired and, you know, you're not, you're, in, you're not, not in the office, so it's easy to not off, but I'll try to make it interesting anyways. But um, this, you know, I have been doing this, well, I, I, a couple of disclaimers too. One is I'm not an expert on, on treaties. One time I got introduced as that, hardly an expert. Um, it's sometimes treaty law can be very complex, can be a little bit confusing at times. And I'm also not a, an, a, a lawyer. And I say that just because I'm going to be talking about some court cases and maybe I always don't quite get the uh, the language right or whatever. And, but you might be going, well, uh, since you're not an expert and you're not a lawyer, then why in the world are you talking to us? Well, what I do have is I have about 26 years of practical experience implementing treaty rights on behalf of my band and, and another band. And so um, I, I've learned, I've actually learned a lot over the few years. And the presentation I'm about to give really stems from over the years having to try to explain treaty rights and trying to explain who we are and what we're doing and why we're here. So uh, if you can go to the next slide. That's really what I want to answer. Who are we? Why are we here? What are we doing? And I might even add, you know, why does it matter? So let, let, let's just jump right in. So next slide, please. So we are an intertribal natural resource management, management organization, and we implement off-reservation hunting, fishing, gathering rights, right? These treaty rights of two bands, the Grand Portage and Boys Fort Bands of Chippewa in the territory ceded under the Treaty of 1854. And so hopefully I've highlighted some terms here, and these are the terms that are going to become clear and clear as we as, as we move along. Remember, intertribal, we work off reservation, and our job is to implement treaty rights on behalf of um, these two bands. So next slide, please. So let's go back in time a little bit. We can go to, oh, around 1800, could be before, could be after, whatever. And we're talking up here in the Great Lakes region, and my ancestors, along with a lot of other indigenous people, lived in these regions. And it really was a semi-nomadic type of lifestyle because you, you know, you didn't have the cub foods or whatever. So you, you had to go to your food source. And so like the picture up in the right there depicts um, racing season. And we just wrapped that up probably all about a month or maybe it's almost been two months. We had a very wonderful and successful uh, racing season. And so at that particular time, the, you know, the tribes would go set up camps around around the rice lakes and they'd gather the rice and they'd process the rice and in preparation for, um, you know, preparing food for the upcoming winter and things like that. And so at various times they might be, you know, um, um, fishing in the rivers. They might be ice fishing. They might be, uh, I think the upper left one is a picture of uh, maple maple tapping time. So point being, the, the indigenous people of this region were living off the land. Okay, next slide. So um, the United States, though, in their, their, their push to move westward to increase their, increase the, increase the country, um, uh, the way they dealt with the native peoples at the time, or still actually still could do, was by making treaties. And there was all kinds of treaties. I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds of treaties were made. And, and I think early on, they were more like peace treaties, but eventually they started to delve into land session treaties. And I believe that's what the Treaty of September 30th, 1854 is. So back on, uh, on in that particular time in uh, La Pointe, Wisconsin, the um, 
representatives of the United States government sat down with uh, chiefs and they're all there. Um, uh, you know, I guess there was a whole bunch of people there from both sides and they, they carved out the treaty. And the Treaty of 1854, I'm just going to read it. I know that kind of breaks the cardinal rule of PowerPoint, but the Chippewa of Lake Superior entered into a treaty with the United States, whereby the Chippewa ceded to the United States ownership of their lands in what is now called Minnesota or the Northeastern Minnesota. These lands are referred to as the 1854 Treaty Area or also 1854 Ceded Territory. So that's really kind of the crux of the treaty. Um, and also, I, I put this uh, reservation established just to remind myself. So, the, at this particular in this particular treaty, the tribes were sort of um, transferring land ownership over to the United States, but they had to have a place to live, right? So, so the United States actually reserved or set aside lands for the tribes to live on, and we call those reservations now. At that particular point, right there, the Fond du Lac and the Grand Portage reservations were established in what's now northeastern Minnesota. And one other signatory, the Boyce Fort Band. Um, it's referenced in this treaty, but they didn't get the reservation until about 20 years later. So, um, But what's significant about this treaty was that, remember, the tribes were living off the land. I mean, they hunted and they fished and they gathered, and that's how they survived. And it became a, a very important to our ancestors to make sure they reserved that right. So Article 11 of that treaty says, and such of them as reside in the territory hereby ceded shall have the right to hunt and fish therein until otherwise ordered by the president. And so uh, that's a significant um, um, statement in that treaty. So can we go to the next slide, please? Now, I have heard the argument over the years that, well, these treaties are really old and they shouldn't be honored anymore and they should just go away because, you know, th that was then and this is now. Well, the Constitution of the United States refers to treaties as the supreme law of the land. So, yeah, they are old documents. They are, but they're very significant old documents that are the supreme law of the land. Okay, so it's 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 not a nice thing. It's it's a very significant thing. These treaties are. So, next slide, please. Now, this is key. If the, if there's one thing I'd like you to remember from this presentation, it's this right here. This was a uh, a the Supreme Court. Uh, um, uh, made this um, statement here back in 1905, and it says a treaty between the United States and the Indians is not a grant of rights to the Indians, but a grant of rights from them. Okay, so a lot of people think, why are tribes given these special rights? They, well, they are special rights in a sense, but they weren't given. The United States government didn't give these rights to the Native peoples, right? They already had them. They had everything. In fact, we basically lost out or gave more away than we reserved. So I think, I hopefully you understand that it's very key. It's not a special right given to them. They had everything, but these rights were reserved of something that they already had. So very significant doctrine to understand when it really comes to understanding or comprehending um, treaty rights, okay? Next slide. <clears throat> now, this is the 1854 ceded territory. So uh, uh, down there in the lower right, it's a little white graphic that kind of shows Minnesota, Wisconsin. You can see, uh, we call it the Arrowhead region up here in northeastern Minnesota. And it's about five plus million acres, and it is resource rich, rich land. If you've never been up here, we've got lakes and rivers and streams and boreal forests and wetlands and swamps and you name it. Very resource rich. We have a lot of wildlife. We got a lot of fisheries, and it, 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 it kind of explains why the tribe set up camp, so to speak, around the Great Lakes, is because they're very resource rich. And so I'm colorblind, and I always forget, but I believe there's a red line that looks like uh, kind of wanders around that map, and that is the 1854 ceded territory. And as I mentioned earlier, the tribes were established, uh, excuse me, reservations were established. So way up in the very right, right upper right corner is where the Grand Portage Reservation is. And it's a very beautiful place if you ever get a chance to go there or I've been there. Um, down sort of in the lower left, the Fond du Lac Reservation was established. That's just south of Duluth where I live. And then up in the sort of lower left, left you have the Net Lake Reservation also and the Vermilion Reservation. They actually come together to make the Boyce Fort Reservation. And as I mentioned, I work for the Grand Portage Band and the Boyce Fort Band. So that's the 1854 ceded territory right there. So next slide. And as was, was mentioned earlier, um, there's, a, there's a lot of treaties. This is sort of treaty country, right? You have the 54, 37, 42. So I put this map up there just to, just to show you that there's a lot of land session treaty areas 
here in the Great Lakes region. As Scott mentioned, there's these intertribal commissions. So they're in our neck of the woods, there's our organization, uh, 1854 Treaty Authority. In the middle uh, logo below is Chippewa Ottawa Resource Authority. They deal with um, the uh, the treaties over uh, where modern day Michigan is now. And then we have the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission who, who works with the tribes that have the 1837 and actually 1854 treaties. And so these are three sort of intertribal commissions, I guess we call them, that work with the tribes to help implement these off-reservation treaty rights. And as was mentioned too, there's actually a couple out in the um, the Northwest, the Native Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and the Columbia River Intertribal Fisheries Commission. It's hard to remember all those acronyms. So, um, so there's only really five of these unique organizations in the United States. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put that up there for you just so you have a visual picture of the ceded land. So, next slide. <clears throat> Now, as I mentioned, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, as the, you know, over, you know, the tribes always had these rights, but I think due to years of suppression really by the governments and persecution, the tribes have sort of, sort of lost, I, I think they quit going off the reservation and they just sort of lost this, this treaty, this off reservation treaty right things in a sense. So, but as they began to realize and understand these treaties, they began to sort of reaffirm or, or, or sort of resurrect these activities. Um, they met opposition from the states. And so a lot of times, or I shouldn't say a lot, so these ended up going to court. And in these court cases, I'm gonna show you, there's a subsequent precedence was set, and then another precedence would be set, and another precedence on top of one another. So, so here we have uh, the state of Washington, as the tribes out there began to assert their treaty rights, the state of Washington was not happy, but the Supreme Court decided that because a treaty right takes precedence over state law, Indians with these treaty rights do not have to buy a state license. So I think Wisconsin or Washington was saying, well, you got to buy a state fishing license. Well, no, the court says, no, they don't. A treaty right takes precedence over state law. And so tribes with these rights are not required to buy a fishing license. So that's one of the precedents. And about 20 years down the line, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, I, I think at this time, too, uh, stemming from an incident where the states tried to step in and say, wait a second, you you can't you can't um, harvest fish with some of your traditional ways by net to spearfish. You have to have hook and line angling. All right. That's the only way that you can do that. Well, this ended up going to court, too, in what's called the Belloni decision. I don't know if I pronounce that right. The federal judge, though, held that the state is limited in its power to regulate treaty Indian fisheries. It has to be reasonable and necessary for the conservation uh, of the of the fish or, or the species, whatever it means. So they can't just come in and say, well, you can't do that. There has to be like, I would say, a biological reason for the state to chime in. So, Next slide, please. Now swing on a little closer to my neck of the woods and in the Midwest. And frankly, when this was going on, I, I wasn't aware of this. I, I went back to school in the mid to late eighties and that's when I began to learn some of this stuff. But um, stemming from a court case from a couple of band members from the Lakota Ray tribe, um, uh, the state of Wisconsin um, um, wasn't happy with tribes over there uh, trying to exercise their rights. And so that's this ended up in court. And in 1983, in what's called the Voight decision, the Supreme Court of Appeals agreed with the Lake Superior Chippewa that indeed these hunting, fishing, and gathering rights were reserved and protected in a series of treaties between the Chippewa and the United States. And once this court case came out, there's a lot of tribes in Wisconsin, they began to exercise their rights, which they had every legal right to. And of course, people looked at this decision here and said, oh, okay. Uh, next slide, please. No. It was just the opposite. So again, I wasn't aware of this. I started learning about this in school, but apparently the, 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 the people in Wisconsin were not happy at all about tribes exercising their treaty rights. And these are some pictures that show, you know, what was going on at the boat landings. There was protests and it just, it was not a good time from what I understand. Not a, um, and here the tribes are out there just trying to exercise the rights that they have because the United States, you know, you know said, they, said they could have these said they reserved them and I got to imagine it have been a tough time so um, so things were not going well in Wisconsin at the time uh, next slide please now in 1985 so you got that going on over in Wisconsin and in 1985 the Grand Portage band as I mentioned I'm a member of the band 
they filed suit with the district court. Really, I, they threw it into the courts and said, look at the treaty, look at the language, and declare that, indeed, we have the right to hunt, fish, and gather in these lands, free, uh, ceded lands, free from state regulation. And the other bands that signed the treaty and resided in the territory, the Fond du Lac Band and the Boy Sport Band, sub subsequently joined the lawsuit. On next slide, please. Now, I, I should say, hold on, I should say too, I don't know for sure, but it's always been my understanding that, you know, that, that the entities over on, on this side were maybe looking to Wisconsin. Is there a way that we can avoid that? Because that's not good for the tribes. It wasn't good for tourism and Wisconsin and whatnot. So, okay, now you can go. And so, rather than continue this through the courts, like every other treaty um, uh, issue had been, had been taken, the, unite, uh, the three bands in the state of Minnesota decided to enter into an agreement to resolve things. And so what the, and this is the agreement that actually we're still implementing today. What this, in a nutshell, what this agreement said is the band mem bands would regulate their own activities. So we have a conservation code and covers, you know, deer and bear and moose and berries and things like that. Uh, and, I, and I would say too, the biggest thing was it, it, it's, it the crux of this is that the state of Minnesota said, um, if you agree to limit your exercise of treaty rights, you can still exercise them, but limit them, which really meant no commercialization for the most part, we will agree to um, and provide you with a monetary annual payment. And so that's really what the, the, the agreement said. So so we have this code. Um, it also allowed for a cross deputization for enforcement. Our COs can enforce state law and state COs can enforce tribal law. And also had to establish a judicial services division because if somebody violates the code, they have, 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 have to have a place to go. So 1988, bans in the state entered into agreement. It was ratified by the state of Minnesota. Next slide, please. Now, in 1988, then, the, the tri-band authority was established to implement the agreement. That was Boy Fort, Fond du Lac, and Grand Portage. Um, tribal councils came together to establish this tri-band authority, again, to implement this agreement. Now, in 1989, the Fond du Lac band withdrew from the agreement, which any party could do with a one-year notice. And sometimes they get asked, um, why did they? And I, I, I can't answer for them. You'll have to ask them. So let's continue on the timeline, though. Uh, next slide, please. So in 1989, after Fond du Lac pulled out, the tri-band authority became the 1854 authority, continued to implement this agreement, for the Boys Sport and Grand Portage bands, and we still continue to do that today, here in 2020. We're small, we have about 15 full-time employees, but uh, we give a pretty good bang for the buck, I think. We have an admin division, someone's gotta, I would say someone's gotta, you know, take care of the paperwork and fill out the reports and sign the paychecks. We have a resource management division, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. We have an education and outreach division, um, which I'll talk about a little bit. And we also have a conservation enforcement division. So, so those are the four divisions of that uh, I oversee for the 1854 Treaty Authority. So next slide, please. And here's our organizational chart. You don't need to worry about all that stuff so much as I wanted you to understand though that my boss is my board of directors is made up of the Boyce Fort Tribal Council and the Grand Portage Tribal Council. They're both five person councils. They come together and they make up the 1854 Treaty Authority Board of Directors. So uh, we are uh, 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 governed by a two federally recognized tribes and that's how the intertribal came into being. So there, those are my bosses. Next slide, please. Few more court cases too. I just wanted to highlight to uh, mention the 1837 treaty where the Mlax ban um, and uh, went to task with the state of Minnesota, and these rights for the Mlax ban to hunt, fish, and gather were upheld by U.S. District Court Judge Chief Diana Mercy, Murphy. That was 1994. Next slide, please. And I mentioned earlier that Fond du Lac pulled out, and Fond du Lac began to go down a, a different path, the path of, of throwing these into the courts. And so um, in 1996, Fond du Lac versus State of Minnesota, the judge ruled that indeed the Fond du Lac ban did reserve and, and does retain the rights to hunt and fish and gather in the territory ceded under the Treaty of 1854. And that pretty much cemented the Treaty of 1854 as valid, um, not only for the Fond du Lac ban, but for the Grand Portage and Boys Fort ban. Next slide, please. And the Mille Lacs issue went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1999, the Supreme Court upheld the rights of the Mille Lacs bands to hunt, fish, and gather 
in the ceded lands of 1837. And so you're talking about what? From 1940 up till about 2000, you're talking about 60 years of, 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 of tribes trying to reassert and get their rights reaffirmed. And so when we meet with the Fish and Wildlife Service, it is a government to government relationship. And that's what we do from time to time. Uh, in fact, we, uh, we most recently um, um, sought consultation when the moose was petitioned to be listed as an endangered species. And so um, Fish and Wildlife Service came up and we interacted on a government to government basis. And so I'm assuming most of you know that, but hopefully you do know that, that um, when you're meeting with a tribe, any tribe, it's a government to government relationship. So very key to remember. So, um, and don't worry about all that busy stuff on top, but uh, you can go to the next slide. is these two federally recognized tribes, Grand Points and Boys, have delegated the authority to implement the hunting, fishing, and gathering rights to this organization. And so we have judicial and regulatory authority over BAM members exercising their treaty rights in the 54 seated territory. Um, you can go ahead, we'll, we'll skip the rest of that stuff for now. So I realize we want to have time for questions. So, so who's our constituency? Any enrolled member of the Grand Portage or Boys Fort Bands, if they come down to our office or we interact with them, they can prove their enrollment. You have to be officially enrolled in a band. We issue an identification card, and that identification card there is the band members, um, um, what they need to go fishing, what they need to go hunting, what they need to go um, gather wild rice and things like that. Um, and so I, this is really important for, for fish and wildlife folks who are in enforcement. Um, as well as any other enforcement, because when you run into a band member out in the field and you say, can I see your license? They're going to give you maybe not a card just like that, but some type of identification that identifies them as a tribal member. So, next slide, please. And so just briefly, we've got band members out exercising their rights, hunting, fishing, and gathering. Right now, it's deer season in northeastern Minnesota, and so we have band members that are out you know, trying to get their deer, uh, hopefully as we speak. And their ID card, again, gets them out there to undertake lawful activities. Next, um, um, next slide, please. I'm not going to read all this, but this is our mission statement, and it's all about the treaty rights. Our job is to make sure that the rights secured to our member tribes to hunt, fish, and gather within the ceded territory shall be protected, preserved, enhanced, not only for present, but for future band members. And so everything that we do drives right out of our mission statement. And we do that by, next slide please, by implementing four goals. Our first, one of our, this is really our bread and butter. It's our bread and butter is getting band members out there exercising their treaty rights. And so program simply means like, you know, for deer, they have to, you know, have, um, um, they have to have tags to be able to go out. They have to have a registration process and things like that. So any one of our programs is designed to help band members get out there exercising their treaty rights. Next slide, please. Um, another goal is to protect and preserve and enhance the off-reservation rights. Now, the rights have been affirmed by the courts. Rights have always been there. But there really has been efforts over many, many years, even decades, to sort of diminish these rights, sometimes maybe on purpose, sometimes maybe not on purpose. But nonetheless, that's where we come in. And so part of this really is educating people. And so this really involves going to meetings and, and educating people and interacting. It might be, you know, writing letters to Congress or, you know, like there's a new administration coming in. Um, they probably have some knowledge, but they may not have a lot of knowledge and there might be you know, from time to time, new senators or congressmen come in and they don't really know about treaty rights and, and tribes and things like that. So it could be letter writing campaign and it could be going out and talking to people. Um, so these are just ways that we have to continually be proactive in making sure these rights are protected and, and, and not uh, taken away So, in some sense. So next slide, please. Resources. I always like to say, what good is a right to a resource if you can't eat the fish, if the wall rice is gone, if, if the resource is not there in such a, such a state that it's, it's unconsumable. And really this is, this is uh, uh, probably our, uh, our biggest program, even though we have a small staff, but um, you know, eight of the 15 are, are, are natural resource folks. And, and this is where it would come in to play where we'd work together with the Fish and Wildlife Service. So, um, and so, and, and resources are under pressure and threats from all areas, you know, uh, you know, moose on the left, there's a picture of moose. Moose is a, is a, a very, um, very popular, I should say, subsistence resource for the tribes 
um, up in the northern part of this country and, and and many folks maybe know or don't know but um, something's been happening to the moose over the last um, decade or so and the population has declined not stabilized a little bit but those are the areas where we need to do research we need to figure out what's going on with the moose do they have enough habitat or not in the middle picture is wall rice and wall rice is 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 really sacred and extremely important part of the culture of tribes in the Great Lakes region. It's part of their identity. And so we live in an area where there's Great Lakes, excuse me, where there's rice growing in the water. <laughs> in fact, we just had a, I, you know, a, a banner year for wall rice, at least in Minnesota. And so uh, uh, extremely good year for the tribe. And then we have a walleye over there. So fishery. So we have, we have game, we have wall rice, we have fisheries. These are the kind of resources that we would focus our activities on to make sure um, that they're available and, you know, and everyone knows fisheries one of the biggest threats is contamination of, of and, and it's really sad but in Minnesota and many other places too we have we have consumption advisories and and, and that's difficult for the tribes because they consume these types of resources at a higher rate than non-tribal folks and so uh, I'm glad to know that there are efforts going on to try to you know clean up our lakes so, next slide please <clears throat> And this resource work too has really been one of the more dynamic ones that dynamic areas that I've seen. I know I've been around here for about 26 years. You know, um, you know, there were things we weren't talking about in the past. There's been a re-upence in, in in potential mining activity in Minnesota. Now we don't take a position there either pro or against. The tribes can do that, but anything that might have an impact to the resources of the ceded territories, we're charged to get involved in those processes to make sure that things are done in such a way that it doesn't damage the wall rice, it doesn't damage the water and things like that. You know, it wasn't that long ago that we, at least aggressive, aggressively like Minnesota is doing now with uh, going after invasive species, but we have a, a couple of full-time uh, staffers working with invasive species because you know, in, in our particular neck of the woods, the, there's an international port in right here in Duluth, and so you know you have the ballast water exchange, and pretty soon the river over there, the St. Louis River, became a sort of potpourri of of invasive species, and 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 fisher fisher folks would go down there, you know, fish, and 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 then go up to this lake, and so it's we're trying to slow the spread the best we can. But again, my point being, those are things that come along, and also we got to deal with, and 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 what's what what's what's now we have climate change, we have issues like that. Um, uh, you know, one of my, one ones that we're in us here in our in Minnesota is chronic wasting disease, which actually um, can do a number on the deer, and it's 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 sort of right at the doorstep, the southern doorstep of the ceded territory. So there's always something coming along that you know we all need to collectively. Every this is where everybody together too needs to collectively deal with these things. So uh, next slide, please. And last but not least is our, our this, we, we call it education outreach or cultural preservation. And so we've always had some sort of um, uh, outreach in this area in a couple of, uh, in sort of a two-prong approach. Um, one, one, we want to just educate the general public about treaty rights. And so we, um, and also we, but also we want to try to engage our youth, our youth plus in um, activities that are part of and inherent to the culture. Because we all know that kids aren't aren't as engaged as they used to be, and they're not all out doing drugs and whatnot. But you know, sports and things like that. Um, uh, so we we work with the tribal communities to try to put on programs that can expose them to the things that are integral to the Ojibwe way of life. And so um, we have a full time person that actually uh, does that, and she does a wonderful job. And also, this has probably been our most challenging thing with this COVID going on because this all involved um face-to-face -face interaction so th this has been very challenging will continue to be for a long time but i like educators though they're very creative and they found ways to sort of sort of work even though we can't be face-to-face -face. so uh, very important programs and just a couple more slides i'll finish up real briefly next slide as i mentioned we have a resource management division and we do a lot of work but again small small staff and so this is the, the only way that we, or the best way we found and everybody's found to accomplish great things is to work together, right? Whether it's the states, whether it's the feds, whether it's the locals, whether it's the tribes, we all need to work together to try to tackle the issues that are, that are important in, in our neck of the woods. So uh, we're very active there. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, this is our education outreach, our cultural preservation division. So uh, we'll keep doing that. And next slide, please. 
And last but not least is our conservation enforcement. We have three full-time officers. And as I mentioned, um, you know, we have five plus million acres. So we do have a, a, a joint powers agreement with the state of Minnesota so that their officers can enforce our code into our court and our officers can enforce state uh, residents or people hunting uh, under the auspices of the state into state court. So, um, cause there's a lot of space out there, but, but their primary responsibility is to enforce the code and help get our band members out there uh, interacting. And this is one area too, where we would interact with the Fish and Wildlife Service, whether, uh, you know, if it became a, a take of endangered species issue or something like that. So uh, that's our enforcement division. And last slide. And I'm sorry if I talked a little bit fast. I, sometimes I was trying to watch the time and leave uh, time for questions, but um, hopefully I was able to get across what we do. We do have a website um, that has a lot of great information. And I wanted, there's a little publication in the, in the, in the left there. It's called the Hunt, Right to Hunt and Fish Therein. It's actually available on our website. If you were to go to our website under quick links, it's right at the top. But this publication right here, really does it, it stem from this presentation right here but it, if you're into especially the first part where we talked about the treaty rights and stuff that was going on in, in, in wisconsin and washington and whatnot um this is a really i think a great publication not to, because we put it out but because it's very interesting and it just provides a lot more background and context to what i tried to um talk about today so um you can tell your your supervisor that the guy that spoke today gave gave you permission to spend some time reading that while you're at work because really i think it can help you again it's 1854 centric so it does help you to it does focus on the 1854 treaty right here but in a general sense i think you can take and apply that to you know where the other intertribal commissions that you might be working with too whether it's a uh, glyphic cora nifwick or critvick um, just help to give you an understanding. And they probably have, they also have great publications also. So um, with that, I will quit talking and I'll hand it back to Chuck. <clears throat> Thank you, Sonny. Um, appreciate you uh, giving that presentation. I've, I've seen it a couple of times and I always learn something. Uh, I always learn something anytime I interact with you or the, the tribes in the region here. Um, and you kind of ended up with education there, and I think that is so important because, you know, these treaties are complicated. The histories of tribes are complicated. When I started in the service, you know, I, I was ignorant, extremely ignorant of the Native American heritage and culture here in the Great Lakes. It's been an honor to get to understand it some and, and certainly interact with folks like Sonny and others. So I encourage you all to learn. Uh, about about tribes in your area or 1854 authority which it's uh extremely helpful it's probably one of the most uh, personally uh satisfactory and enjoyable parts of my work with the fish and wildlife services is the ability to work with tribes we've got a couple questions uh that have come up we've got a few minutes uh the first question was is this going to be recorded and available and my understanding is yes that it will be um, second question is going to be for Sonny. Um, you mentioned the hunting and fishing, uh, but uh, the question was, in addition to wild rice, are there other gathering, you know, traditional gathering uh, things that the tribe has the right to? Yeah, I think gathering is not as maybe popular as it used to be, but I know they, they uh, some of the tribal members gave their pine balls because they're able to um, gather pine balls and, and, and put together wreaths and things like that to make a little extra in birch bark gathering. And there's a lot of medicines and berries that we don't regulate or whatever. So um, there is gathering going on, but a lot of that's not regulated by permits. So a lot of it just happens to go on. I hope that answers the questions. Thanks, Sonny. Um, God, I think this one is for you. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the educational opportunities the service provides to uh, its employees and, and how they might be able to participate in that? Sure. We, uh, we have, as I stated there, each region has a liaison who does uh, tribal government consultation processes that they, they teach that. Uh, that stems from a core uh, training, training program that uh, I, along with Chuck and others, uh, participated in developing as an outgrowth of the update to our Native American policy. So uh, that happens in-house in regions, but we also have opportunities that come up 
uh, for instance, the um, Alaska region has a great program that they, they put together on uh, tribal treaty rights and gives that uh, perspective of what's oftentimes overlooked in the lower 48, um, that aspect of Alaska, uh, which is our certainly our sister state that, uh, that has uh, the bulk of the Fish and Wildlife Service property as well as um, a large number of the tribal uh, communities, 230 plus tribes uh, there in the state alone. So, uh, but the training that we do for uh, tribes is, is significant. Uh, National Conservation Training Center uh, supports the training for tribal members. Uh, two tribal members uh, from a given tribe per year can participate. And it's something that my program in concert with the National Conservation Training Center helped to offset the costs of that training for the tribal member participation. Uh, and in addition to that, we do training internally to the regions to out, outreach to tribes. Uh, we did one down in the Southwest on uh, disease uh, management and fish uh, handling processes at hatcheries, which was just outstanding. Had some of the, some of the uh, greatest participation of the Southwest tribes in years uh, together with us to, to go over that. So if you have an interest in training, certainly talk to your regional liaison, uh, whether that's for your training or for training of tribal members. Thank you, Scott. And I think, you know, that's an important point. One thing that I've certainly learned that um, uh, every tribe is, is unique and different. All the treaties are unique and different. Certainly um, the rights of Alaska tribes are very different than uh, some of the treaty stuff that Sonny just talked about. The 1854 treaty doesn't apply to anything outside of 1854. That was one of the questions. So I wanted to um, point that out. Uh, we're coming real close to the top of the hour, so I'm, I'm going to do one more question and then I'd like to ask the director to kind of close us out here. Um, but the question is um, from Kathy Cox, she's working on a plan for tribal engagement for Texas State Parks, currently in the information gathering stage. Can you point me towards any useful resources? Scott, maybe that one's for you. Sure. For Texas State Parks, so... Uh Comanche uh, are one group who actively participate in aspects re related to Texas, but for the most part, Texas uh, does not have a lot of tribal interactions. So I think certainly working with the liaison uh, out of uh, Albuquerque um, to uh, see, we, we just hired a, a new employee on and um, his name is Wes and I can put you in contact with them uh, to talk about ways that you might be able to develop that plan in working with the Comanche communities who historically were from that state, but uh, now uh, may, might reside more in Arizona at this point, but still have a vested interest in what goes on in, in the state of Texas. Thank you, Scott. Um, I, I think the, the most important takeaway from this is we all, we certainly have a lot to learn. I've been uh, working with tribes for, for 20 years and have a whole lot to learn. And maybe the first contact in the Fish and Wildlife Service is your regional Native American liaison uh, to help make those connections. We're at the top of the hour, and I would like to turn it over to Director Skipwith for any closing remarks and before we move on. So, Director Skipwith. You're on mute again. <laughs> I love the mute button. <laughs> um, thank you everyone for attending to today's session. Um, Scott Aiken, Sonny Myers, um, it truly was a pleasure for you guys to be able to share your knowledge, share your history, and share your experience. Um, it's all part of our makeup as Americans here. It's all part of our history. Um, and being able to learn something new all the time is helpful especially when we're all in this space of conservation. Um, so I really enjoyed learning about um, court cases, especially, um, and really defining and understanding the rights that um, tribal nations, Alaska Native corporations have as well. So um, I look forward to our next session that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chuck, for being our host and everyone. If I don't see you before the Thanksgiving holiday, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.